So, um, I wanted to start with, uh, with an article by John Osbaugh uh, called The Infinite House, uh, which, uh, which uh, contains a critique of a process called the five whys, uh, which is a method of retrospective and, and getting at uh, uh, root causes of, of failures and, and other events uh, by uh, uh, repeatedly uh, asking why a particular symptom occurred until you get to a new symptom and, uh, and keep going back the chain about five or so times, which is a, a, a they've decided is a good number um, for getting at to whatever the root cause is and taking an action um, that uh, prevents that outcome in the future and gets you to a, to a better outcome. So you uh, stop. So where was I? I was at the five ways, root causes. Uh, great, we can, uh, we can uh, have better outcomes uh, once we get to these root causes, change things in our process, learn from them. Awesome. Um, but one of, the, one of the critiques that he offers of the five whys is that uh, in a lot of ways it's actually too simple a model uh, to understand the ways in which the concept complex systems that we work with uh, can fail, right? Uh, a lot of the times the, the systems we work with and the world, worlds that we live in uh, are much more intricate. Um, they have a lot more entities. They don't really follow this neat linear pattern uh, of cause and effect. Um, and a lot of times things have multiple causes um, there's really no good way uh, to trace backwards to these multiple causes um, using this method. So a lot of times systems look more like this, right? These really deeply interconnected webs of many entities and uh, rich interconnections. And, uh, and we need a, a way of getting, getting at many of these paths so that we can get a better model of the world um, so that we can learn from it. And uh, what he offers as an alternative, he calls it the infinite house, which is in, instead of asking why something happened, we ask how something happened, um, and we do that sort of uh, repeatedly and deeply and try to get uh, uh, richer information at, at, at every step. Um, and he says, in order to learn, which should be the goal of any retrospective or post hoc investigation, you want multiple and diverse perspectives. And you get these by asking people for their own narratives, um, which is something that stood out to me is really important. Right? You, want, uh, you want people to share their stories, their subjective, experience uh, of a failure event, right? It's not something you hear very often. Um, uh, you want, uh, you, you uh, ask probing questions to ask uh, what, what was going on in your, uh, what were you thinking about at the time? What were the options you had available to you? What were the alternatives uh, that were possible? Uh, who did you contact? Uh, and really uh, uh, explore all those little branches uh, that you could go down. Um, and once you do that, once you could construct that uh, individual narrative, you can uh, compose that uh, with other narratives from people who experience those events and get yet an even richer model uh, that we had, uh, than we had before. And uh, you know, one of the reasons this stood out to me was it's not something uh, that I was taught or that I would uh, learn from uh, my uh, computing uh, or software education. Um, it's something that seems hugely important to the way that I actually uh, work with software in the industry. Um, and surprisingly enough, it was uh, sort of conceptually something I was introduced to more in uh, my experience with theater studies. So um, in theater studies, we learned about um, Bertolt Brecht, who was a German uh, playwright and uh, director from the early uh, 20th century. And, uh, he offered a, a similar critique of, uh, of the Greek tragedy, um, that he uh, uh, saw it as, as a, a similarly linear, far too simplistic model uh, of, of storytelling, um, centered around an individual hero who underwent some sort of tragic event and has to suffer their way through it uh, until they get some insights into their suffering and is able to take an action uh, to, to change that. Um, and Brecht really wanted uh, his theater to be an instructive theater, uh, one that really expressed all the, all the intricacies of the worlds that we live in so that we can take uh, better actions um, to, to get better outcomes. And, and the way he, uh, he felt uh, that he could do that uh, was by uh, creating techniques uh, in what he called the active theater, epic theater, um, where audiences were, were constrained to, to see the events on stage through the lens of, of multiple characters, right? We decentered the individual hero's nar narrative and saw that as a part of an ensemble. Uh, many individuals uh, were, um, 
you saw the events play through through many individuals on stage. Um, and uh, the, the characters on stage uh, articulated their decision-making processes as well. Um, they talked about their alternatives, um, how uh, they could have taken another decision and maybe have gotten to a, a separate outcome. Um, and that struck me as, as, as really, really similar to, to what I saw in this work. And the other thing that, I, that stood out to me was, uh, was that focus and an embrace on, on narrative as a way of understanding these complex systems in, in, a, computer, uh, in a computational space. And uh, that embrace of narrative is something that uh, I know uh, more from the conversations that I've been having with my partner about ethnic studies, and she's been very patient teaching me a lot of, a lot of that stuff. And, um, and really, uh, ethnic studies, for those who aren't familiar, is a, is a field of study that um, seeks to understand and teach and, and share the stories and histories of racialized people and, and people of color, um, in particular through their own perspectives, uh, using their own lens, using uh, our own words um, to describe those experiences, um, which is in opposition to many traditional fields who do that from, a, from an outsider, sort of obje objective, uh, alienating, usually Eurocentric white perspective, right? Um, and uh, it's a very broad field. Um, it's a very, uh, it's an interdisciplinary field. Uh, among the work it produces is a lot of quantitative information and, and studies and research um, to explain these stories, but it, it can't live up to its mission without embracing narrative. Um, and really seeking out individual and collective narratives uh, about the communities that we seek to understand. Um, and so it really goes out of its way to, to find those in, in as many spaces and as many media as it can. As it can. Um, and uh, nonetheless, um, despite um, all the information that it produces and the rich models that um, it is able to produce uh, in, uh, about the world, um, it often gets criticized almost because of its embrace of narrative, uh, its embrace of sort of individual perspectives, and perhaps even because of the kind of analysis and the results of that analysis that we get um, from it. Um, and that's something that, uh, at least from what I've seen, uh, uh, John Mossbaugh has not had to deal with as much, right? Um, and that's something I think we see in the tech community as well, um, in that when people share their experiences of marginalization and their experience um, in the tech community, they're often, really, the really common refrain is like, is there data to support what you're saying? How can you make such a general claim about this? Is there a study? Is there research? And of course there is. There's a wealth of research. There's a wealth of information. But even if there wasn't, um, that shouldn't invalidate um, the experience, um, especially when we are doing the work to, to get the deeper stories, um, to get the deeper explanations. We're doing that work to compare those stories uh, with other people in, in our communities and to really understand those models. So, um, and uh, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons for these, uh, I, but I think at least part of this reason, you know, coming from a, from a programmer's perspective is that I think uh, programmers, uh, software engineers, um, really uh, like to privilege uh, quantitative tools as a means to understand the world. Um, they really seek that as the primary, if not sometimes the only means uh, for, for getting information about the world. And uh, a lot of the times, that's, there's so much information that, that's lost um, when you're not exploring that. Um, and you know, one, one illustration I'd like to, to show about this that I found really interesting um, was uh, from Gerald Weinberg and his uh, introduction to general systems thinking. And uh, he's, he's describing sort of this, the space in which we can understand uh, different parts of the world. And, and he puts, uh, on this graph, he puts uh, the level of randomness on the y-axis and the level of complexity uh, on the x-axis. And he carves uh, this into, into three spaces. Um, and in the lower left corner, we've got a space that is uh, really uh, well, organi uh, well organized, which is to say it's not very random at all. Um, but it's also very simple. There's very few entities. There's very few interconnections between those entities. Uh, and com conveniently, this is a space that we can understand through, through formal means, through analytical means, through mechanical means. Um, and that's great because we get a lot of information about these kinds of things in this space. And in the top level, we get uh, uh, an area that is highly random, right? There's large, large levels of randomness, arbitrary levels of complexity, but um, sufficient randomness to be analyzed pretty thoroughly using statistical methods, 
which is also great. We get to understand uh, a large part of that world. But there's this vast space in between, or in the third space, that uh, is sort of too structured and too organized to be uh, understood with statistics, but yet it's too complex to be understood formally. So it asks a big question of what do you do there when you have neither of these tools available to you? Um, and uh, this is a space of, of ambiguity, right? This is a space of uncertainty. This is a space um, where we don't have algorithms, we have heuristics, right? This is a space where we have uh, judgment, maybe intuition, but uh, not so much script, right? Um, and it's this, it's exactly the space that I think um, the infinite house and this embrace of narrative, I think, tells us that, that if we sort of are willing to leave these tools behind, um, we can explore a lot more uh, of our complex systems um, by these means. And you know, I think, I think what uh, software people try to do is that they try really hard to get everything to fit in this formal space or in this statistics space as much as possible, and uh, maybe without realizing that um, they're using these other tools to pull them into those spaces when, uh, when they have them available. Um, and the other thing uh, is that um, even, even when we recognize that our systems might be too complex for these tools, we might draw a hard line and say, um, in order to, to, to reduce the amount of things that I have to think about on a daily basis, um, I'm only gonna care about the computer things, the things that run on the machine or whatever that may be, and everything else, um, the space that gets a lot fuzzier, mostly the people, uh, <laughs> we're just gonna, <laughs> We're just going to leave that off because it's too hard uh, to think about or it's not worth the energy or it's not the thing that I care about. Um, and I think we do that to our peril because um, there's a, uh, I challenge really anyone to be able to draw that line distinctly, right? Um, technology is a tool, which is to say it's a, an extension of human capability. Uh, people build, run, operate, and use our software. Um, and we might very well miss uh, points of leverage that we would get um, if we were willing to reach out uh, onto the other side of that, that boundary. And so uh, I am glad to have stumbled uh, across uh, Allspa's uh, paper because it does um, give us some tools for navigating that space. But one of the core requirements uh, of being able to do that well uh, is, is the idea that we have diverse perspectives uh, to, to, inform, to inform that exploration. And, and the reason you want that um, is because when you're doing that composition, no matter how deep you sort of do that individual narrative, when you do that composition into a collective narrative for shared understanding, um, if you're getting the same perspective every time, you haven't added any information to this space. Like if everybody's seeing the exact same thing, you're not seeing anything new when you're composing the narrative, right? So you want definitely a diversity of function, at the very least, different you know, people who interact with the system, ops, QA, I think we're comfortable with that and in most places, but you also really want a diversity of history and experience uh, and really uh, because people's sort of value systems that they bring with them and other contextual information really affects like what you're inclined to see um, at the point of a failure or some other, some other event. Um, and what's really neat what I've got up here is that, it's that I think that there's a positive feedback loop that happens there where you're um, where you create, uh, where when you have a diverse environment with diverse perspectives, um, you create a, a better learning environment. When you create a better learning environment, uh, you're sort of better able to attack, attract and, and retain those diverse perspectives. And the loop works the other way around as well, where if you have a homogenous environment, you're sort of less able to see um, what it is that you might be doing uh, that uh, keeps those diverse perspectives out of your environment. Um, and that feeds back into um, I do, uh, with the last time I have, I, I want to quickly just sort of restate the question of why we would want to do this. And I think um, a few people, and I've touched on a little bit earlier, uh, you know, see sort of the, the business and organizational benefit uh, to doing work like this, uh, to be able to uh, uh, learn and get better outcomes in our organizations. But I really think that uh, it's important to be able to have richer models of the world um, because of the hazard involved in that as well. And uh, I, I want to explain this by way of analogy. Uh, I once took a motorcycle safety course, 
And uh, one of the first things they tell you in a motorcycle safety course is that most drivers can't see. They don't see, right? And if you're in their field of vision, it doesn't matter, you're in direct line of sight, they're not trained, they're not attuned to seeing objects in their field of vision that look like you, right? And so it gets really, really difficult to want to share a road when you're exposed and vulnerable to the environment in a way that someone who's in a car is very shielded and sheltered from it. Um, and it might especially be the case when someone's in that car and is willing to move fast and break things. So, <laughs> uh, and I think there's a, there is a, a big risk uh, uh, involved in that, that, that our inability to perceive people as vulnerable in our systems, as part of our communities, as our users, um, we can take actions that have unintended consequences that are really rather big. We build platforms in which you know, people experience waves of uh, online harassment, right? Um, we make changes and tools that inadvertently expose people's personal information uh, to people that you know, shouldn't have access to or can compromise their safety or even open it up to surveillance. And so um, it's important, I think, that we um, are, are able to, to use these tools um, to be able to, to perceive the world better. And I think for many of us, it requires um, really uh, giving up our sense of expertise over experiences that we don't have, um, over consequences that we don't feel, um, and uh, giving up our sense of that expertise over the methods and tools by which we understand it. Because you know, I, I want to believe at least that, that uh, technologists are here uh, in an attempt to make the world a better place and really trying to make uh, you know, delightful leisure time and better work environments or whatever the case may, may be. Uh, and I, I want to be a part of that goal as well. And I think um, we need to do that not by driving past or around people, and not by driving through people, but, but really by driving with people to that goal. So that's all I have to say. So.